couple of sermons ago, I started to say a couple of weeks ago, it's been longer than that now. Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> a couple of sermons ago, <clears throat> we talked about how important the Word of God was. Matter of fact, we talked about how the fact that it is probably the most important thing, hallelujah, in your spiritual walk. Amen? We talked about how that it is impossible for you not to be deceived unless you know the Word of God for yourself. We are living in a day where we have, and it's been this way forever, but the, the uh, television and satellite and all of that certainly makes it easier for the false teachers to reach the masses than it used to be. Used to, it was more in this area or that area, but now all you have to do is flip on the television and you will find false teachers hallelujah, left and right. Amen? I don't take any joy in saying that. But we are living in a time where if you do not know the Word of God for yourself, it is so easy for you to be deceived. Amen? Yeah. Because they will say, well, oh, yeah. this is truth and that yeah. is truth. And if you don't know what is the truth, then it will be hard for you to keep from being deceived. Yeah. We talked about how that Jesus, when His disciples asked Him, what would be the sign of the end, the sign of His coming, He would say, take heed that no man deceive you. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. So we talked about how important the Word of God is for you. Yeah. And then we looked, the sermon after that, we looked at how people had rejected the Word of God. How that people have, as the Bible says, heaped to themselves teachers, having itching ears. How that the Bible says that they will turn away from the truth and they will turn unto fables. And we looked at how yeah. and why people reject the truth. The truth is rejected. The main reason is because people don't want to face the truth. And out of sight, out of mind. They don't want to face the Ten Commandments that member the Charles was talking about before service this morning because the Ten Commandments tells you not to commit adultery. It tells you not to lie. It tells you not to murder. And whenever you're faced with those things, then you're faced with the fact that you are not living right. You are not doing that which you should do so they don't they want to do away with the moral law because they do not want to live the moral law we read how that the people asked the prophets not to preach to them the truth they said speak to us smooth things prophesy now this is what they asked them brother charles prophesy unto us lies yeah amen yeah, Speak to us no more about this God yeah. because this God is holy and He is righteous. And we don't want any part of that. And that is where America finds herself today. Exactly Brother Sleece was talking about the false doctrine in whenever he was talking. He was talking about how that preachers today cannot bring themselves to tell the crowd, you're a failure. Because they have compromised. And that's what we talked about the last time we preached. Was the deadly cost of compromise. We talked about King Saul. Whenever he was ordered of the Lord to destroy all of the Amalekites, utterly destroy, kill them all. But Saul and the people decided what was good and what was bad. Not, upon, not because of what thus saith God, but they decided upon what looked good to them. The church world today has done the exact same thing. They have decided what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. What is holy and what is vile. And they have accepted it not according to what thus saith God, but according to what their flesh wants. Mm -hmm. So this morning, one of the preachers got behind their pulpit in their mega churches. It is impossible for them to stand there and say, You are a failure. Yeah. Within yourself, your flesh, there is no good thing. Your flesh will take you to hell. Mm -hmm. Only through Jesus Christ can true victory be found. Only through Jesus Christ can true life be found. You on your own are a failure. But you will not hear that from the mega church preachers. They will tell you that you can do as long as you look inside and find the power within you. There is no power within your flesh. Only through Jesus Christ can you do all things. And this compromise, this cancer of compromise that is eaten away at the body of Christ, we find ourselves today a church that is not effective anymore because she has compromised herself out of being effective in the world. Amen. Yeah. One of the definitions for compromise, we read, is to lessen the value 
of someone or something. Compromise has lessened the value of the church today. Compromise has caused the church almost to become a laughing stock to many. Mm -hmm. Because when you turn them on, it looks more like a three ring circus than it does a house of God. Mm -hmm. Because of compromise. Mm -hmm. When Saul was confronted by the prophet and he said, why didn't you obey the voice of the Lord? Saul began to talk about how well the people mm -hmm. wanted this. Mm -hmm. Amen. And when it comes right down to it, we talk about how Saul gave the people what the people wanted. That's what we find today mm -hmm. in our pulpits. And that's probably why our church mm -hmm. is not full this morning. Because I'm not here to give you what you want. I'm not here to give me what I mm -hmm. want. I am here to give you what thus saith God. Mm -hmm. And it's becoming more and more rare. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, you don't have any trouble today finding compromising preachers. You will have no trouble today finding someone to scratch your itch. If you come to our church and you don't like it, and we don't we don't scratch you the right way, well, don't worry. There's a church down on the street corner that will scratch you the right way. Yeah. Amen? Heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, compromisers. Preachers no longer preach on hell. No longer preach on sin. They have compromised to the point to where there is no line anymore. The line has become so blurred that it doesn't exist. Afraid, offend Afraid they will offend somebody. That everything and anything is okay. And where did that where has that brought us today? Where has compromising preachers brought us? It's brought us to a church world that thinks it's okay to drink. It's okay to gamble. It's okay to live together and shack up. You don't have to be married. It's okay to be homosexual. The only problem with all of that, those things today, my friend, is because it is according to this book, none of that is okay. Amen. That's right. The only problem with your doctrine is it doesn't line up with the Word of God. Yeah. The only problem with your belief is it does not line up with the Word of God. And I got news for you. Come this on. is truth. Come on. Not what you think. Not what you suppose, not what you want, but this is truth. If it goes against the Word of God, it is not truth. Amen. God's Word is truth. Amen. Amen. So King Saul, he spares Agag, and he spares the best. You remember, get the sermon. He spared what they thought were the best. And what were they going to do with some of these things? They were going to offer them as sacrifices to the Lord. The very things that God told them to destroy, they were going to take and offer as sacrifices to the Lord. Why? Because they decided what was good. They decided what was right. They decided what was bad and got rid of it. They decided what was right and kept that. Instead of basing it upon the Word of God and what God had said, and based it upon what they wanted. And that's where we find ourselves today in a compromised church that have taken the things that should have been destroyed and separated from mm -hmm. and have mixed darkness with light mm -hmm. and vile with the profane and, have, and are producing strange fire. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Yeah. Yeah. Compromise. I just read about that. The deadly cost of compromise. You see, I told you this. Compromise, nobody wins with that. You don't win. The people you think that you have drawn in because of your compromise do not. There's only one person that wins because of compromise, and that is the devil. The devil is the only one that wins whenever we compromise. And Saul here, whenever he was confronted by Samuel, and Samuel said, you didn't do what God told you to do and Saul would face the deadly cost of compromise as Samuel turned to go away Saul would grab a hold of his mantle and as he did the mantle would rip yeah. and Samuel would turn and say just as that just as you see that and this is, this, is, this is not a quote but he said you see that Saul that's exactly what's been done to you this day because of your compromise because of your rebellion I've taken away. God said, I've took away the kingdom from you and I've given it to someone else that's better. And he was talking about King David. But even King David, as we move on from Saul and we look at the life of David, even David knew all too well what compromise would cost you. Mm -hmm. 
The Bible says at a time whenever kings went to war, you know what that meant? That meant that David was supposed to be out on the battlefield with his men, but he wasn't. He was back at the house. Couldn't sleep one night. Decided to go out and walk on the rooftop. Or it might have been morning. I forget exactly oh, yeah. how it goes. Yeah. Decided to walk on the rooftop. And guess what he sees? He sees a woman taking a bath. Yes. Amen. And no doubt he might have thought, as our minds work, he was a man just like we are. Amen. And maybe he thought, well, it won't hurt to look. Amen. Yeah. Preachers today, listen, they didn't get to where they're at with beer in their churches. Amen. Overnight. They got there because they compromised a little here and a little there. Because they thought, well, if the enemy convinced them, if you'll do this, you can get more people. Then you can lead them in the right way. If you'll just give a little bit here, if you'll just, if you'll just compromise a little bit here, the problem with that is the compromise don't just want a little bit. The devil don't just want a little bit. You've heard the old saying, if you give the devil an inch, he'll take a mile. Amen? That's the way it is with compromise. Compromise will take and take and take until there is nothing left. When you, you started out, I'll just compromise a little bit. Till now, you're in a place where you don't know what's true and what ain't. You've spent so much time pleasing your flesh and pleasing your crowd that you're unable to even fathom the thought of getting behind the pulpit this morning and looking out across to your huge crowd and preaching them the truth and preaching about hell and preaching about sin and preaching about the abominations that are in the land today. Yeah. So David thinks, well, I'll just look. It won't hurt anything just to take a peek. And David, though a man who was certainly highly favored of God, as a matter of fact, the Bible says he was a man after God's own heart. He was certainly a man who knew how to repent. He was certainly a man who knew right from wrong, but he was a man. And he was better than Saul. God, God said that himself. He said, I've given it to somebody better than you. Oh, yeah. He was better than Saul, but still, he was flesh. Uh -huh. yeah. Still, he was weak. Yeah. Still, he found himself in this position. And instead of... Nick, it could have been an accidental thing. You walk out there, oh my goodness, somebody's taking a bath. i got to get back in the house. No. And he might have thought that at first. But then maybe the enemy said, it won't hurt to look. So he looks. He takes him a little peek. He compromises. Took him a little look-see. You know what? That led him to laying with her. Then that led him to trying to cover it up. Then that led him to murder. And it all started because one morning he took a walk out on the rooftop and decided he would take a little peek at a woman taking a bath. Bathsheba. Bathsheba. Mm -hmm. Amen. Little by little, compromise will strip away from you all of your power. King David would find himself being confronted by the prophet Nathan as Samuel had confronted Saul. Nathan would confront David. Yeah. And David, whenever Samuel, whenever, whenever David thought Nathan was talking about somebody else, David rose up and said, Oh, let me know who he is. You're this man's man. done a bad thing. You're that man. <laughs> and Nathan stops and says, David, you are the man. Yeah, you're that man. Oh, and then David realized the terrible cost of his sin and the terrible cost of compromise and that which was birthed from that would die. Death would come from that. That's what will come from your compromise today. Compromise wins no one. Nobody wins with compromise. We could, come, we could decide today, well, we're going to lighten up on some things and we're going to allow some things to go on and we're going to try to get us a crowd and that's all you would have is a crowd. You'd have no presence of God. You'd have emotion. You'd have some kind of, you would have the accolades of man perhaps, but I don't know about that. I think we've done gone too far. They already know that we're out there not part of that, so it wouldn't do us no good to compromise now. Not that we even want to. Amen? Hallelujah. There's a point that you get where it's too late to compromise. <laughs> Hallelujah. When you couldn't draw a crowd even if you compromised. Amen? Because you've already been labeled. You've already been marked. 
as one of those that have separated themselves from the world, I mean, from the false doctrine and teachings of the world. And David would learn of this dear cost. And it all started with his sin, his compromise, just a little. Song of Solomon says that it's the little foxes that spoil the vines. Amen. Another man we could talk about this morning for just a minute is Samson. You see, Samson could tear lines in half. Brother Sleece, he could conquer Philistines. But he could not conquer his lust and his flesh and his own appetite for that which would eventually lead him to the place where he was blind and powerless. And that's where compromise will lead you. When it comes down to it, you see, that's the reason for compromise is man's appetite. Either I want to please Brother Charles, so I'm not going to say nothing that will offend him. Now I'm talking about as far as preaching. Yeah. We shouldn't try to offend people with our flesh. But i got news for you. The Word of God offends. Mm -hmm. The Word of God will confront your sin. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amen? Yeah. The Word of God will show us where we're missing the mark. Mm -hmm. The Word of God at times, I know there are times that, that we think, We'll read it and we're glory to God. We're high and lifted up and everything. And there are other times we'll read it and be like, oh my goodness. That just hit me. Because it will cut like a knife. Amen. Hallelujah. And man compromises because of his appetite of his flesh. And the Bible talks about Samson in Judges the sixteenth chapter, how that he went down to the valley of Sork and he met a woman there by the name of Delilah. You see, but when you sleep with Delilah, you don't just get Delilah. You get the Philistines that come along with it. When you compromise, you don't just compromise a little. It affects all the rest of your life. Amen? Yeah. If he'd have just had Delilah, that'd have been one thing. But that ain't all he crawled into bed with. When you get Delilah, you get the Philistines. And the Philistines will leave you blind and grinding at the meal. Amen? Powerless. Which is where it left poor old Samson. Amen. Till he repented. Hallelujah. Till he repented. That's what the church needs to do. The church needs to repent. Preachers that get behind their pulpit service after service patting you on the back and allowing you to continue on your merry way toward hell need to repent. Preachers need to repent and go back to preaching the Word of God. Not what thus saith man or his psychology or the word of faith or the, the, the prosperity gospel, but preaching what thus saith God. Yeah, thus saith the Lord. Well, Samson would find himself, he compromised himself right out of his power. And that's what the church has done today. That's the deadly cost of compromise. How about Solomon? You might be out there then you might think, well, I'm smart. I can compromise a little bit and it ain't going to hurt nothing. I'll be all right. Solomon was the wisest man that ever lived. But God warned Solomon against his alliances with Egypt. But instead of following God's instructions, maybe he thought he was smarter than God. Because Solomon would wind up not only having an alliance with Egypt, but he would marry Pharaoh's daughter. And it wasn't long before King Solomon took more wives who worshipped pagan gods. Yeah. And the result was this. That when Solomon was old, his wives turned his heart away after other gods. Yeah. And his heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord, his God. Why? Because of compromise. Because he probably thought, I can handle this. Till it got so far out of control, he couldn't handle it no more. I have no doubt that many preachers today that have compromised started out on the right track. But they got talked into doing things that they thought would draw the crowd. Because they thought, surely I can do more good if I've got 5,000 than I can if I've got 15. So they begin to do little things, that seeker-friendly things. Change the music. Change the message. Change the version of the Bible. Change the atmosphere. Make it more, make it more pleasing to the flesh. Yeah. 
And now they find themselves today lost, and most of them don't even know it. Really? Most of them don't even know it. Lost. Leading a crowd of lost people. So here we see, we started out with Saul. Compromise. Paid the deadly cost. David suffered because of his compromise. Solomon, Samson suffered because of their compromise. And you might be out there today and you might think that there's not a whole lot to what this old country preacher is talking about. But one day, when you stand before God and you're judged out of the book Amen. that you compromised, yeah. then you will realize it costs far more than you would ever wanted to have paid. Amen. Right. Hallelujah. One day when we stand before God on Judgment Day and we give an account, and we will be judged out of by the Word of God. Amen. Many will stand there as Saul did and say these words, I have played the fool and I have erred exceedingly. We will reap what we have sown with our compromise. Today there is a clarion call in the land to return to the Word of God. To return to the message of the Bible. To return to the cross. The Apostle Paul suffered because of his Refusal, refusal to compromise. Yeah, oh yeah. He talked to the church of Galatia and he said, Have I now became your enemy because I tell you, tell the, you truth? the truth? Yeah. These same people, Brother Charles, in just a verse before that, he said that he was persuaded that if it had been possible, they would have plucked out their own eyes yeah. and gave them to him. But because of false doctrine and false teachers, now they viewed Paul in a sense, as their enemy. Yeah. Why? Because of the message that Paul preached. And that's what you find today. Now whenever you preach about hell, now when you preach against sin, now whenever you preach against false religions and joining and making alliances of false doctrine and those that teach false uh, doctrine in the church, now you find yourself as the odd man out. Yeah. You find yourself as the one that well, he just don't know. He hasn't. He's he's not modern enough. He's, he's he, exactly, and he's not economical enough, as Brother Swagger uses enough. that word a lot. We got to be more economical. Join hands with the Catholic Church. Join hands with the with the uh, Mormons, and join hands with all these others that teach false, not just false doctrine, but heresies, yeah. damnable things that send people to hell. Yeah. But let's compromise and join hands with him. Paul suffered from this. He said, Do I, are you, am I now your enemy? You used to love me so much so that you take out your own eyes and give them to me. But now I'm your enemy because I tell you the truth. Because of those who had preached false doctrine, Paul's refusal to compromise, he was now treated as an enemy to those in Galatia. And you know, We've talked about this before. He would say, Oh foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? They had been they had been convinced to compromise. They had been bewitched. When you refuse to obey the truth, that is a form of witchcraft. Samuel would tell Saul that rebellion was as the sin of witchcraft. There is only one cure as we close this morning. There's only one cure for compromise. And that is to return to the Word of God. Amen. We've talked about how important the Word of God is for us and for our spiritual walk. Yeah. So much so the Bible says that that is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. The Bible says that man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. God's Word sustains us. It is our lifeline. Yeah. It is that which reveals to us the truth. God's Word is that which reveals God's will to you. Yeah. The only way you can know God and who He is is to know His Word. That's right. Can't separate the two. God and His Word are the same. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Amen. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. It is important for you today to know the Word of God. Absolutely. And we've looked, we've looked at people in the Bible that rejected it and the, and, and the 
the terrible consequences that they faced in our nation is no different. The Bible says that a nation that forsakes God will be turned into hell. Yeah. If you reject His Word, you reject God. I had some, someone said something silly. They, they asked the question, well, is it possible to be saved and not believe the Bible? No, no. it is not no. possible to be saved and no not way. believe no the way. Bible. You must have faith in God's Word. Amen. By grace are you saved through faith. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. There's only one cure for the compromise, this cancer that eats away at the church. And that is to return to the Word of God. To return to the message of the Bible. To return to not the self-help gospel. Not the prosperity gospel. Not the I can do it all through my flesh gospel. But return to the gospel of the Bible which is man is lost and undone without God and on his way to hell except for one saving grace and that is the finished work of the cross of Calvary. There's one door, one way, one truth and that is the message of the old rugged cross. It's still the same. When Jesus stood there before the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the disciples and the people of his day and said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He did not say, I am now the way. No, He'd always been the way. All the way back to before the beginning of time, He had always been the way. He's still the way today. Amen. He's still the same Jesus. Still the same way to get to heaven. There's only one message today that saves mankind. There's only one message today that delivers mankind. There's only one message today that is the hope for the world. And that is Jesus Christ and Him on, crucified. Amen. Come on, brother. Only Jesus. And that's the only cure for the compromise today that we see in the church. To return, to forsake the gimmicks, the holy water, oh, it makes me sick to my stomach. Order my holy water! Oh, God. And it'll heal you. Oh, God. Drink it and it'll cure your innards. Wash with it and it'll cure your outers. Take my anointed blood of Jesus prayer cloth or my anointed a holy oil. My one woman, she's on again last night, going to have all these prayer shawls and she's going to lay on them. Pray over them. And then each one of those, as you buy them, of course, $59.99 plus shipping and handling. As you buy one of these prayer cloths, not prayer, uh, prayer shawls, one of these prayer shawls that she laid on, and you bring them into your house, it's going to destroy the generational curse that has your family bound. It's going to cast out that generational demon. Honey, I got news for you. There's only one way to destroy the generational curse that is on you, and that is the finished work of Jesus. Only through His blood can Satan be defeated. Only through the work that He accomplished on the cross. Not in your prayer shawls, not in your prayer cloth, not in your holy water. Only through the blood of the Lamb Amen. is Satan right. defeated. Amen? Right. And if you have received Jesus as your personal Savior, if you put your faith in Him, there is no generational curse on you. Amen. Because every Glory curse, every curse is destroyed when you come to the cross and put your faith in Him. Because on the cross, He destroyed every curse and every bondage. And if you put your faith in Him, you don't need her fifty-nine ninety-nine no. prayer shawl. That's a sales page. That's exactly right. You don't need their snake oil that they peddle. You don't need their elixir that's good for what ails you. Amen. It's the same thing that you see in the Western movies and. Maybe some of you in here this morning was old enough to remember it as a kid. But as they came around on their wagon and they had that miracle tonic they would sell, it would cure lumbago and it would cure your arthritis and it would get cause you to grow hair. That's exactly what you... It's sad. That's what you see them doing in the name of Jesus today. Oh, yeah. It's a cure for all. It's a get to do you good. Oh. Amen. <laughs> There's only one thing, one message, one hope for America, for the world, for you. That is Jesus Christ and His finished work. Oh, yes. Amen. His finished work. Hallelujah. When He said it is finished, He meant He don't need your prayer shawls. Amen. He don't need your holy water. Hallelujah. He don't need your blood of Jesus prayer cloths that you say. He don't need your red anointing. No. He don't need your water from Jordan. 
Amen. All it takes is His blood. Hallelujah. To wash you and to cleanse you. I want to read this scripture in closing. This morning we've cut our teeth on it. We can probably quote it by heart. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. That is the cure for the cancer that eats away at the body of Christ today. That is the cure for a nation that is on her way to hell because she has forsaken God and His truth. Turn to Him before it is eternally too late. If my people, His church, will turn back to Him, return to preaching the Word of God, return to preaching the cross, then we can be effective in these last days. You will never be effective by telling people, well, you can be everything you can be. There's a, you can have your best life now. There's a champion inside of you. The only champion inside of me is Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Without Him, I can do nothing. Hallelujah. My, my, my. There's a cure. It's Jesus. Always has been. Mm -hmm. Always will be. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. Someone else this morning. Have something before we go. Hallelujah.